In this video, I'm going to talk about dependency injection. Dependency injection, in a nutshell, is what makes your .NET apps pluggable. Think interchangeable parts and easy to maintain. To understand how that works, let's first talk about two subjects, interfaces and service architecture. Service architecture is just the practice of creating a service class to contain the business code per each of the app's business objects. And it allows us to keep API controllers clean and only focused on responding to requests. So for example, we have a products controller here for a fictional application that manages products. We have a git list of products, create new products, and we've moved all of the business logic out to a service class, the product service. And here we have four methods, get a list of products, get products by AD, create a product, delete a product. So create, read, update, delete. Now to actually use the service in a controller, we do so like this, with the constructor method. By using the name of the class plus a variable, in the constructor, we can instantiate a private object for, from which we can then use all of its methods. So as you can see here, I have all of the methods in that service class available to me here in the products controller. Now why do we do that? So in a real simple application, if we put all of our business logic directly here in the controller methods, the problems begin to arise when we want to use that retrieval code somewhere else, or we want to use that create product code somewhere else. Like let's say that later our application has invoices, and on those invoices we have products or lists of products. So if we put all of our create logic here for products, when we want to use that in the invoices controller, we would have to rewrite that. So that's the reason that we encapsulate things in service classes. Typically, you'll have a service class for every business type of object that you have in your application. So that's the reason why service architecture is used. Dependency injection improves upon the service architecture by taking it one step further. By using classes in our constructor, like we have now, we're creating a direct dependency. If months later our business logic in dealing with products needs to change, we'll need to create a new class, like product service version 2, to contain the new code. Of course, we could overwrite this code, but that's extremely bad practice and shouldn't be done. So that's why I say we'll need to create a new class when we want to change up code. Now once we create this new class, this product service version 2, we'll be faced with a maintenance problem because everywhere in our application, in all of these constructor calls, these dependency points where we're using product service directly, the original product service, we'll need to go and we'll need to change all these manually to point to version 2. Now in a small application that might not be such a big deal, but in a larger application where you have hundreds of these dependency points, thousands even, that could be a maintenance nightmare. So we want to avoid that. This is the reason dependency injection exists. This is the problem it solves. Dependency injection allows us to create indirect dependencies. With dependency injection, we'll use an interface instead of the class itself everywhere it's called upon. So in other words, we're using an interface as an abstraction. This is the first step in using dependency injection, instantiating dependencies with interfaces instead of classes. The second step is when we define the link between the interface and the class at the top level of the application. But we'll look at this in a minute. So now that we're using interfaces, let's look at one. Here's an example interface for the product service. You'll see there's not much to it. 
Interfaces are just the blueprints for a class. They only contain method signatures, not any actual code. They define what methods must be present in a class to fulfill the role. This is what allows pluggability, in that you can create multiple classes that fulfill the role of an interface. This is what's known as implementing an interface. Classes implement an interface like this, by typing the name of the interface with a colon after the name of the class, we're implementing the interface. So what does this mean? It means that we are now bound to follow what is outlined in this interface. So we must have a get all products method that returns an ienumerable list of products. We also must have a get product by ID that returns a product and takes an integer as an input. If any of those things are missing, in this class, then we won't be implementing the interface. We'll get an error. So if I were to remove this, we get this error and it says product service does not implement interface member get product by ID. So by using the interface, we are guaranteeing that all of the required methods with all of the same inputs and outputs are going to be there in our class. And this is what makes the interchangeable parts idea function. So now that we understand service architecture and interfaces, let's return to the top level of our app and take a closer look at the registration line to see how we register services to dependency injection. There are two main things happening in the registration line. The first is defining the link between interface and the class that we want to use or the class that we want to fulfill the role called for by this interface. This is where we'll say use product service version 2 everywhere else. So we only need to define the link one place. Everywhere where I product service, everywhere where the interface is being used in the constructors, that's what will get swapped out at runtime by dependency injection. So that's the first part, defining that link. The second part is here. This is where we specify the lifetime of the service. When we talk about lifetime of the service, we're speaking in relation to a request lifecycle. A request is like someone hitting an API endpoint and getting a list of products, or sending a request to create a product. Requests happen all the time and are typically short-lived, happening in milliseconds, and there could be thousands happening per second, depends on your the size of your application or the traffic that it has. So there are three options that we can specify when we register services to dependency injection in terms of lifetime. They are singleton, scoped, and transient. Singleton is by far the longest lived of the three. Singleton means that one instance of the service will run from the startup of the app until it's shut down, which could be months. Singleton is useful for services running in the background, like a logger or a task scheduler. It's the least common of the three registration types. Transient and scoped are really similar, actually, and they have short lifespans. A scoped service will instantiate once per each request, where a transient service will instantiate once per each time it's used, which could be multiple times in one request. So transient, therefore, has the shortest lifetime. Transient is also the most common, and is the registration option you'll usually use. Now that we're using interfaces to inject our services everywhere, and with the service registered to the dependency injection container, we're done. That's all there is to it for using dependency injection. Now our app is much easier to maintain. Dependency injection has other benefits too, like taking care of disposing services when they're no longer needed, and making the application easier for unit testing. Lastly, I did mention there was one other way to bring services in, and Microsoft calls this calling services from the main. You'll use this method of instantiating services when you need to use a service during the app's startup process. 
An example might be if you needed to do some seeding to your database when your app runs for the first time, or maybe a logger service. So this is the example from Microsoft. It's a little confusing, but if you follow this, you'll be good. Just call this create scope on the services container. From that, you'll get a service provider object which will be able to later pass a type and, re and it'll return an object or an instance of that service class which we can then use the methods from. So this is the method that you'll use 1% of the time, constructor method 99% of the time. If you're coming from ASP.NET MVC5 like I was, you may be wondering how did we do this before? Did we use dependency injection before? Well, before .NET Core, dependency injection was not part of the framework. Instead, you needed to use a third-party package like Castle Windsor or Autofac. Each had their own code patterns, quirks and features, and probably were not as fun to use as it is now. Now dependency injection is baked into the framework. So be sure to check out my website where I have a written version of this lesson as well as application code which you can download for free on GitHub. Also check out the ASP Nano Boilerplate which is a lightweight multi-tenant based solution that can save you a lot of time if you're setting out to build a new web application. I'll leave the link to that in the description along with a link to my blog and if you enjoyed the video click subscribe and I'll be sure to post more.